All right, I think we can I think we can start now. So hello everyone. Thank you for coming to my not GDC talk. So for uh, those of you who are new here, we're just some folks who aren't a GDC who spontaneously decided to host a bunch of talks with very little prep. Um, unlike the weeks and months of rigor a GDC presenter usually goes through before they show something. Um, on a bunch of topics we're interested in. So today, what I want to talk to you about are some multiplayer best practices. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Omid or Omid. Both pronunciations are correct. Um, Omid is how it's usually said in English. Omid is what my mother calls me. It's how it's said in Farsi. So if you ever want to get my attention, Omid is a good way to go. Um, I'm a senior software engineer. I've been making games for 15 years. Uh, these are a few of the games I've made. Um, I've worked on a whole bunch of things. I'm a bit of a generalist. And today I'm going to talk about multiplayer. So I didn't really include multiplayer in this list of things that I've done um, over the years because it's kind of like a part of everything. It's just sort of a thing that, that happens to you. And I prepped a bit of an outline that is kind of like a list of things that I wish people knew when they were making multiplayer features in a video game. Um, and before I start that, as you can see, we're going to fill out the rest of this together in a bit. I want to ask you all a question, because I'm used to knowing a little bit about the people I'm giving this talk to. And so I want to know, for the people in this room, how comfortable roughly are you guys with your multiplayer programming? So I'm going to post a poll in the Discord thread. And then... Let me see if I can get the reaction set up. Over. Ooh, you also can see what I'm doing. Uh, so let's try this. Two. Three. And the way I think about a question like this is if, like, if somebody came by and asked you like to make a feature in a multiplayer game like how comfortable do you feel like do you do you roughly know what's going on or not because um from here on out this is more or less uh an interactive talk you're welcome to ask questions comments share your knowledge as we go and i'm just going to share what i know and roughly what best practices i have and try to target it roughly at the folks in this room and and keep it to a level that's interesting for everyone here so Let's see. We've got a lot of people who know just enough to make terrible mistakes. That's wonderful. Uh, some people who mostly know who things, where things go. That's great. Um, nobody wants to pretend to be an authority here. I was wondering if anybody would. OK, thank you so much. You can, you can be an authority and be ready to make terrible mistakes. I take, let me tell you from experience. So. All right, that's pretty good. So we got like a mix of people down the middle. So enough people kind of know roughly how things go, um, but also enough to know how to make mistakes. So let's, let's, okay, let's do this. So I will start with a primer just to get everybody on the same page. And let's do it over here. Okay. So this is a computer. I know my drawings are great. And um, this is the internet. And let me just put another computer over here. I'll make it a uh, boxy CRT. Does anyone ever have to develop UIs simultaneously for four by three resolutions and widescreen ones. I have. That's a special kind of nightmare, isn't it? I, I was so glad at one point when we kind of the industry just shifted away from needing to support both. But um, okay, it's it's been returning with the iPads. Oh, good grief! As a web dev, that uh, was my my whole thing. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now we have ultra wide support. Hello, computer. Are you still with me? Okay, cool. 
Uh, let me go down and pick another color. Let's go with this sort of orangey red. Right. So um, so let's say we want to send a packet through the insurance. So let's say we're the computer wants to send like packet A. It'll go in here. It'll bounce around. I'm treating this like a bit of a black box. And eventually, if we're lucky, most of the time, it arrives at the output and you get packet A out here. Now, one of the quirks of the internet is that if you have a, another packet, let's say we send packet B, um, it may arrive uh, in a completely different time in a completely different way at its destination such that your packet B arrives before your packet A. And so in network terms, this is called uh, usually uh, unordered. Hold on a second, let me just adjust my brush a bit. Unordered. And then on top of that, if you have, say, a third packet and it travels through, um, it might just never arrive at all and just get lost during transmission. And so that is often referred to as unreliable. So if the order of things that we sent into the network was one, two, three, then the order we might get out might be something like this. And this is just kind of like, I mean, really, it just is never there. It's not even three. And so um, there's a way of looking at this. I'm going to draw the grid where we go, uh, this is unreliable. This is uh, reliable. Nice big square for us here. And this is um, unordered. This is ordered. OK, cool. So um, the internet is basically here in this top corner. This is also um, where things are really, really fast. We don't have to do a lot of extra work. So if you've ever like heard of like a, a protocol called UDP, this is, this is where it sits. It's unreliable, unordered. This is how we send packets through the web. Um, there's also like things like TCP and things like that, which do a lot of handshaking and effort to make sure that like a message is both guaranteed to arrive and they arrive in the same space and things like that. But basically anything where you start to expect things to be reliable um, begins to get really, really expensive uh, as far as like video games are concerned. Because instead of just firing off a message and expecting it to arrive, we have to do all this sort of overhead. And when we have like potentially tons of actors and things like that in our system, it can be really expensive. So we're going to come back and reference this a bit later when I talk about like trade-offs between using certain tools that Unreal is giving us. OK, so uh, the other thing to cover, which might seem a little straightforward but or simple, but I'll just lay it out anyways, is let's say we have a computer. And this computer is our, um, this is our server. Right. And then down below, imagine we have a bunch of uh, clients. Cool, so this is a client. And then we just kind of like, we're gonna separate these out one second. Let's get, uh, let's get one more client drawn in here. Okay, cool. So um, in games, usually we have one person who's hosting, sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's not, and a bunch of people connected. And so um, your clients will each individually talk to a given server, your server will send messages out to a particular client that becomes the hub. Your server can also be a client and is often a client unless you're running what's sometimes called a listen server or a dedicated server. And so you may have like a client who is also authority. And then we also often call, so 
I'm using this term. Authority is what's up here, the guy at the very tip of the triangle. And then these guys are often referred to as just remote. Okay, cool. So, um, right. So let's talk about Unreal. So in Unreal, if you were to boot your editor up, um, and you were to want to go hit play on a on a system, there's a little dot dot dot. This will work in like Unreal Four as well, where you can specify how many players you want to spawn in with. You can also specify your net mode. So by default, when you boot this, um, you get the option of standalone. Sorry, let me stop that from happening. So uh, it, it's standalone by by default. And if you were to hit play like this, you'll get an extra window for your, oh, sorry. Let me set the number of players to two. You'll get an extra window and like they won't be in the same game world. If you were to go and set this to say, listen server. So this is the, the client acting as both, or the, the server acting as a host, but also as a client. So it's um, just basically two, two clients in this game. That's what's happening here. And you can see our third guy. And by the way, the, the project I'm running in right now is just the default um, Unreal third person test map. So nothing fancy going on here. OK, cool. If you were to go into here and you do play as client, it'll look similar. But what's actually happening is that both these guys are clients, and there's like a third process in the background, which is acting as a dedicated server. So it can sometimes be like helpful to jump into these to test like the various edge cases and things like that. I so that's the basics. Now we can jump into what Unreal's got for us. Does this all make sense? Any questions? Yep, makes sense so far. Cool. Okay, so Unreal and what it does. Um, let's talk about let's talk about RPCs first, actually, because they're pretty quick to go through. So RPCs are short for Remote Procedure Calls, and they basically come in in two varieties. There's like they're they're, they're functions that you can call on a on a server or client, and then they will invoke on uh, other clients in the network. So basically, in this in this diagram, you can imagine um, the dotted line, each sort of area being its own world, and everyone's got kind of like their own thing going on there. Um, if you call a function here, you can potentially get a function called up here on the server and in other places. So there's a U function specifier you can specify on these. Um, I believe it's. Um, one of them is called server. And if you specify this, this is basically sending from, uh, from a client to a server. Then there is also um, client and uh, net multicast, which do very similar things. So I just bundle them together into the same category. But this is basically a function the server call can call that will broadcast to um, all clients. So as far as this type of RPC goes, um, it is incredibly useful. This is basically one of the only ways that we have of, of as a client, sending input back to the server. And so this thing here, I'm going to just grab some more colors so I can make it pretty. This thing here is really good, and it is um, great for framework. Like, like for instance, if I had like a game and I had like a treasure chest and I wanted to open that treasure chest, I wouldn't make an RPC for like open treasure chest. I would, I would probably make a function. I probably make like an interaction system or something like that that just works in general. And I would say, hey, interact with this object as. A, a remote procedure call and then have that kind of um, call into the objects on the server and, and then work it the, way, the rest of its way through that. So this thing is, is great for that particular purpose. Um, on the other hand, you can see by the red color, this thing, so okay, you can use this, uh, but generally speaking, it is problematic. 
there are better ways of communicating from server to client. So unless you really have to, this is sort of like a gin general um, avoid because it'll lead you into a whole bunch of traps that I'll kind of um, talk about in a second, mainly around like join in progress and replication and stuff like that. And so we can we can come back and maybe talk about why that is specifically in a second uh, after I cover one more thing. So I meant to mention this earlier, but if you were to go to Unreal RMI, or sorry, RPC, if you go check out the website, you can find like all the details on on what's what and what else, everything else is here, and. Um, you can also specify like whether things are reliable or unreliable in these sorts of, of functions, which is basically the stuff we talked about here. So that is that is present and specifiable on these guys. Okay, cool. So that's that's roughly RMIs. The other excellent way of sending information across um, is replication. Uh, sometimes it's called net serialize. Um, what what this does is like if I, if I had to place it in this particular square, it's kind of in the unreliable ordered category where it's still relatively cheap, um, but kind of with an asterisk because it'll do some things that are uh, reliable uh, and it'll do some things that are unordered. And I'll, and I'll show you what they are in a second, but. In general, this is like the go-to way of, of transmitting your data across the network. It has some limitations though, and I'll describe them. So it is primarily a, um, a sorry, let me get a color. Hello, color, come to me, cool. So this is primarily a server to client replication method. And the way it works is uh, if we were to take our diagram of this stuff, just literally going to take it, yoink. Maybe make it a tad smaller. OK, cool. Um, what will happen is that you can have uh, you can basically set an actor to be replicated. So in this particular example, I'm going to have an actor named A. It's created on the server. And what will happen is that that actor A will get sort of spawned for us on any relevant clients. This is what happens if you set something to be replicated. And so it'll happen here, and it'll also happen for this guy. I, I just won't draw that stuff over onto the side. And um, on top of this, you can basically take some of your uh, uProperty specifiers on an actor, and you can set them to be uh, replicated. Um, and there's like another syntax for you doing this uh, called like replicated using. And so when when a variable is replicated, so let's say um, let's say I have a var. And let's say this is uh, maybe on the left side of this, whoops, is my server. Now my client, I have a, a variable on, uh, it's just I have the same thing on a client. Here, I'll label this so it makes a bit more sense in a second. So this is, um, so this is, uh, client over here, the client version of an actor, I should say, and this is the server version. All right, cool. Um, so if I were to pick a color, just to write to scribble in here. So let's say um, at the start of all these things, these these two things are synced. So let's imagine it's an integer in here, right? And on the server, we change that integer to be like a one or something like that. That will transmit across the network in its own time. And then on the client, you'll get basically this value changed from zero to one. And on top of that, if you use the um, the replicated using thing, you'll also get an event, which is uh, like a rep notify, which is really, really helpful for, for making code that doesn't, that basically is all event-based and that would just sort of like 
triggers and something else knows that you've changed and then it can change. You don't need to worry about ticks and things like that. So it's super convenient. Now, one thing to watch out for here is that let's say our server was really quick and it bumps the number to two and then to three in really quick succession or before um, the next year. Uh, go ahead and send that across the network. What will happen is that the client will only ever really get bumped to the value of say three here. It'll it won't get the progression of one, two, three. It'll just go one, three. And so this is the way in which I say this is like semi-reliable. It won't get every single thing, but it will always give you kind of the latest value in a given in a given area. Does that make sense? So with so this is okay, so that's that's one limitation to be aware of. The second limitation to be aware of is um, if you have two U properties. So for instance, let's say I have my var one or just whatever that one. And then let's say I have another U property on this thing, which is like my var two. Um, right. If I were to basically increment a value over here from like, let's say this one is like the value A and then I change it to the value B. And like, I'm doing this in um, in time with like when I changed to number two or something like that, or rather when I changed to number three, you're not guaranteed, I believe, that the order of replication is the same. So if you like went to B and then you went to three, you might get three on the client and then B on the client, if you know what I mean. So my understanding is order there is not actually uh, guaranteed, but there are there are ways to get around this when you have like two variables that that need to depend on each other, um, and this kind of leads into the other the other property of this, which is that U properties get serialized um, atomically. So if you were, for instance, if this rather than this just being like a variable or a character or whatever, if if this guy here was a struct, um, then all properties of that struct would get sent across at the same time. So it's sort of like a, a way you can you can kind of get around the the ordering problems just by grouping related sets of variables together into the same actor U property, for instance. Um, cool. So this so this effectively lets us like group things, and there's one other thing to be aware of, in part because of this, when you go to serialize data, it serializes, it has to serialize all at once. It has to serialize like in one go. And so if you made the contents of this variable like really big, like really, really big, like you have like an array of things, um, the engine may fail to, to send that across the network. And when it does, it's just going to straight up disconnect your your client who can't receive that information uh, and just like kick boot them out of the game. So you have to be mindful that the things that you replicate within a, a U property don't get too large. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, the engine will kind of like fail safe out on you. Okay, I've I've given you some scary things about this, but I promise this is actually the best way to do this in part because it's like super optimized and you kind of, when you know in what ways it's reliable and what ways it's not, you can basically use those tools to your advantage when you're designing your systems. All right, so that was, we've talked about the primer, RPCs, replications. Uh, okay, cool, let's, let's go over this. Join in progress and relevancy. Um, they're, they're kind of similar. In fact, like usually the solution to these problems is sort of the same thing. But let me give you a breakdown on what relevancy is. Unreal Engine will do um, a very particular optimization where if an actor that was spawned into the game, actually this applies to even things that are placed in the level, is not near you, uh, like really, really far away from the from the player. So I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a top-down view of our game world. So imagine our player is here and he's like facing in this direction over here. And imagine we have an actor A sitting over here in this corner. It's very possible that this, the engine may decide that like 
this actor, uh, the, the A is not relevant. And when something is not relevant, um, if it was like, say, spawned into the game at runtime, the engine will just actually destroy it. It'll remove it. It'll like wink out of existence. And then if, for instance, at a later date, let me grab a color again. Um, our player P later in, oop, uh, let me pick a color. Okay. Um, let's say our player P is later, say, looking in this direction um, and can see is like within a certain radius check and within like some dot product checks and things like that. There's, there's a whole bunch of tunables for, for this. Um, it will then again decide it is relevant, at which point actor A may just reappear. And it's going to look in game kind of like that actor was spawned again for the first time. So you'll get, uh, in this particular case, you'll get like another begin play call, and then it'll replicate everything else again, and it'll just like proceed as though it was normal. And this can lead to like a whole bunch of funny bugs that are not obvious when you're in the middle of making the game, right? Because like usually you just you, you do something you test and it's there. But like if you had like an object which was like a building and the building got destroyed and you walked really far away from it and it became not relevant and you came back or looked in its direction and it became relevant, um, you might just get like the destroyed animation playing again if you're not careful about how you lay out your your actor classes. Make sense? So, yeah, sorry, go on, please. No, I, I was thinking, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, cool. Um, so I haven't been checking for questions in the uh, chats. Cool. I All did right, have a quick good. question, actually. Yeah, please. So with the Unreal's relevant system, is that specifically for multiplayer, or is that in general for Unreal's calling? Um, that'll be in multiplayer only. Okay. So in other cases, it won't do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you have to, you basically have to wonder like if this, this actor is, is, is present or not. And so what I could do at this point, I was going to jump into some examples and we can kind of like choose our own adventure here. I could do, um, we could do like a, a, a quick, design exercise that would like guide us through how we might make um, some sort of feature. I could jump into game, show you guys how I would make uh, a simulated proxy. How, how do you guys feel? What are you, what are you thinking to want to know? So I think, let's uh, say, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. I, mean, I, I was going to ask, so I guess one thing that's really helpful is like um, in regards to relevancy, like let's say you spawn an actor and then it's supposed to constantly be running a loop of like an animation or something that's like, I don't know, a hammer yeah. smash or something. And then like you get out of relevance and you come back in, how do you sync it back up and all that fun stuff? That'd be a good exercise. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, that might actually be more fun to just demonstrate to a degree. So I, I'll, let's just jump into code and start doing stuff. This is, this has been enough theory. So what I'll, what I'll make is um, what's often called a simulated proxy. If, you've, if you haven't heard of these before, it's, it's a fancy word for just basically an actor, which is completely um, authoritative on the server. And it's probably like the most common type of multiplayer feature that gets added um, after you kind of get your, like, your core game and framework and stuff, stuff running, right? So we'll make something together that um, basically gets spawned by the server, can change its state, and then can replicate across the network. And then in doing so, I can show you how you might control um, what exactly the, the tools are you have for basically trying to synchronize an animation or something like that in, in that particular space. Sound good? So to do that, Let's um, let's make a class. So we have to kind of make an object. I find it's easier to think about this if I'm thinking about it in terms of an actual feature. So for this, let's say, uh, I don't know, maybe like 
maybe for this example, let's just do like something similar, simple like a door or a gate. And then I can talk about how you might like synchronize the animation state of it after we actually get it running. So let's try that. So let's make a new actor. And uh, let's say I'm going to just call it uh, not GDC gate, ng gate. Cool. And take our gate, and our gate would probably have uh, a couple states on it. First, I'm going to clean this up a little. We don't need a tick. Uh, we don't need these comments. We can play, we can keep. Oh, goodness. Is my stream lagging for everyone else? It is for me on the audio. Yeah, it's for me. I was getting some spikes. Uh huh. Using a lot of CPU is what's happening right now. Uh, sorry for the interruption, folks. Uh, OBS. Uh. Well, we can just try to make the best of it for now, and hopefully, uh, hmm, actually, Scott, are you are you doing the recording for this? Okay, I'm gonna stop my own recording so I have some frames back, and then I'll just count on you to finish that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, cool. All right, so yay, I can I can use the computer again. Good. Uh, all right, so we don't need tick. Don't need to comments on this stuff. Um, let's say our gate has a couple of states on it. Um, let's say it has uh, open. Actually, probably should figure out our interface first. So for for something like this, you'd want a function on it that says like set gate open. To set it open or close, and then like some kind of like toggle state. So this would be a E function. This would be blueprint callable. And um, blueprint authority only. This this just basically means that if the non-server calls this particular function, it will just not actually call it as far as um, as far as blueprints is concerned. Let's make a definition for this. And so our um, gate open would basically uh, change this particular variable over here, which we are going to make replicated. So what would it do? It would say, well, if the state I'm setting it to is not equal to the open state, um, then just change the state. Right, and so um, when we make this replicated, we want to um, use this replicated using flag to set a function that gets called whenever the variable changes for us, so that we can like change the state of our gate. Right, so um, the convention is usually to just make a, uh, a function with the name on rep and then the name of the variable. So I'm going to do that. Um, so void on rep like so. And this is part of what we have to do. Let me make the function for this. One, oh, mm -hmm. okay, better. Um, two more things we have to do before this will actually work. One is uh, inside the actor itself. We need to make sure that it's a replicated actor. So we would say set replicates to true. And then we would also go into the, uh, we have to implement one other function, which is virtual void get lifetime replicated props. And I always forget what the signature for this is. 
So the best way to do it is to just go looking, find someone who's already implemented it and Uh, attempt to get someone who's already implemented it. There you go. Copy that in. So this would be overwritten. Okay, cool. And so um, the thing I'm about to show you is there's a there's a macro you use with these guys. In fact. Often the best way to remember what the macro is is to go look up what these people are doing. Um, do rep lifetime. And so this is where you have to declare the variable that you're 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 trying to um, you're trying to replicate. So in this case, we made a variable called b is open. And then on top of that, um, there's a header file we have to include. Let me go back to where. I found that it will surely be including it at the top where it's it's like Unreal Network or something like that. This guy here. Yeah. OK. So net Unreal Network. OK, once you've got that, I think things should compile. We're telling it to be replicated. We're telling it how it wants to be replicated. And we've got a variable that is replicated. Do I have a compile error here? Let's find out. Did you also add in the module or? Uh, you don't need to do with this one. I think it just works. Uh, your functional rep has a uppercase B. Oh, thank you so much. And this also, I think, needs to be declared as a function. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you OK, cool. So oh, and down here as well. All right. So um, the pattern that, that works really well with this type of thing, at least the, the way I do it, is I will make a function which is like on, um, on open change. And I'll include, we're going to go straight for like the, 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 the nice way of doing this, um, a variable on it uh, regarding like whether or not we should skip the animation for this particular thing. So if the gate opens, it'll play an animation to opening. But like if it came into view and then suddenly popped into existence or something like that, um, we wouldn't want to like play the open animation again if it was already open. So that's the idea behind this is that our interface will, will need to care about this. As far as the thing that we're making, um, we're going to want to also do like blueprint implemental event. Um, that will like let us hook into blueprints and then do actually something with this. So um, I'm going to make two. I'm going to make on gate opens with a pool b skip anim, and I'm going to make another one uh, and call this one on gate closed uh, with a similar signature. And then we'll just sort of like hook up the rest and blueprints as we go. And so the idea here is that um, whenever the rep, whenever the variable changes, we want to make sure that um, we call into on open changed. And on open changed will basically say this: if if the variable if the thing is open, uh, this has now become open, right? Then we would basically call the um, call our on gate open function. Set that to uh, use this. Oops, my naming convention. That should be B skip animation. Like so, otherwise, we would go on gate closed, and we would also pass forward the skip animation flag. Just for niceness, I'll fix it. Thank you. Um, and so now, anytime it replicates, it changes, but the catch is that while this will work on the 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 um, clients, the server won't get it. And so the the convention I use is that anytime we change a variable that is replicated, we just call the the change function for it. 
just so everything kind of runs through the same code path. And for something like the, the set gate open function, you always want to play the animation. This is just the legitimate way for the game to change the state of this thing at runtime. And then based off of that, it'll, it'll open and close. Right. Does that make sense? Let's see if it compiles. So this, this macro here, this DREP lifetime, um, there are many different versions of it with conditions, with um, one important one is initial, hmm, I'll dig it up a bit later, but like you can, you can tell it to basically only serialize the value at, at its initial state and not the state that is changed to, which is often very useful for, for synchronizing animations and stuff like that. So let's, um, let's get this set up first, then we'll come back and talk about that a bit more. So I am going to uh, jury rig a quick test here. So we have our gate, cool. Let's make a object that is our gate. So BP gate. Excellent. And then let's just give this um, something to represent itself with. So like you're going to be a cube or something like that. I. And so um, for this guy, we gave it two really helpful functions, right? We said um, on gate opened, yeah, and on gate closed. So we basically want to do something to this gate um, so we can see that the, that something has been done. I feel like I'm going to cheat just now. And instead of trying to like animate something crazy, maybe we just change the material of the gate. You guys all right with that? Yep. Cool. We'll do that. Then I need a material instance. Uh, what I'll do is I'll basically pick a couple colors. So let's say red is going to be closed. Let's actually pick a red. Reddish, reddish. And then we'll pick like a greenish for uh, open. And I'm going to just do alert. And here's a neat trick. Um, if you want to avoid instancing materials, you can do just a regular variable parameter. And in its custom primitive data, look at its uh, primitive data index. You can set this to anything you want. I'll leave it at 0. And so stuff that into base color. And then inside of the. Um, mesh itself, you can actually write into that primitive, uh, custom primitive index, and you can sort of get uh, a color going. So let's um, first assign our material to that. Oh, yes, the content browser is like right there. It's so nice for um, Unreal. I'm actually going to see if I can make this a little bit nicer to view on stream so it's not as small as it can possibly be. Okay. Is that a keyboard shortcut you used for the content browser? Yeah, it is um, control space, and it brings it up in any window. It's okay, my Thank you. favorite UE5 shortcut so far. It's great. So, OK, we've got our, our gate material here. And just to show you the thing that we just did, there is um, primitive, custom primitive data it's down here. So if I add a variable here, and as I move this from 0 to 1, you can sort of see the material is changing. Cool, right? Okay, so what we will do is set custom primitive data on the cube at data index zero. And we'll just do something like, um, I guess we will do a timeline after all, make a timeline. All right, and let's add a, let's add a track, float track, call it animation. 
uh, we'll make a node at time zero. We'll make a node at time one. I'll set the value to be one. So it's just like a linear whoop, up we go. And then we'll jump back over to our event graph and we'll say play. So if as long I guess as long as we're not skipping the animation, we would do this. Let me just whoop, on update, we'll pass our animation value into the curve. And then if we are skipping the animation, oh god, forgive the spaghetti. So if we were not skipping, you would play. Uh, and then similarly here, if you are um, not skipping, you would go here. And then we would basically say, let's just assert the state that we want to be at. So if the gate is open, it would be at state one, showing us the green. If the state gate were closed, it would be at state zero. Right? That seems right. Okay, cool. So we've got our we've got our I guess gate cube whatever cube gate. The light on top of uh, maybe a gate or something like that that's telling you whether or not it's open. Um, the thing we want to do next is somehow trigger it to change state. And so I'm going to maybe use a trigger volume. Let's just drop one of those in the level. Okay, cool. Make it a little bigger, maybe. It was like 2.5 times scale. And then actually, can I make it into a blueprint class? Yes, I would like this to be a blueprint. Um, object? No, I want it to be an actor. Hold on, I'll do this the old fashioned way. Let's go and make an actor. This is my trigger. volume. Inside the trigger volume, I'll make like a um, box collision component. Yeah, we found 2.5 to be like a good scale for that, right? And then inside here, what I'll do is I'll make um, a variable that's like my gate. And that'll be pointing to a gate. Uh, pointing to the C++ class of the gate would be light. Uh, that way you don't end up like incurring the uh, the memory cost of the, the material and the other things we stuck in there. Always a good practice in the best practices video. So um, cool, our gate should be public such that I can drag a trigger volume into the world. Maybe make it a bit bigger, be a little bigger. <clears throat> from here. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. Uh, and then on the side, I'm just gonna put you over here. Uh, we're gonna say the gate you're referencing is gonna be this one, the one that's in the world. So now I can go back to our trigger volume and say, um, on this thing, there should be like an, an overlap. On component begin overlap, yep and on component end overlap is the other one we want. So all of this is to just put together like a super crude testing environment for this. So our gate is going to, I think we had a set gate open to what state we wanted. And then we also have uh, another one down here that can toggle it closed. So, so Technically, because we made this blueprint authority, um, it'll only execute on the server. But just to be like perfectly clear that this is not uh, happening on the client as well, we'll say basically switch off. You are authority, set the gate to be open, and then similarly, if you are authority, do this over here. But I think in terms of what the interface is supposed to do, it shouldn't make a difference because that would only ever run on the server anyways. But too many assumptions can make for a disastrous live demo. So let's let's do it this way. So, okay, we've got our gate. And if we walk into it, um, we're hopefully going to see a change. We yeah. don't. Forgot to set up the true. Um, oh, that trigger. makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Yeah, up here, right? Cool. 
I will not so confidently close this window this time. See it happen. Okay, so if I walk up, hey, okay, it changed for our server. And we leave and it goes red. That is nice. Let's take a look at our client. We walk in. It lights up for the client, but not for the server. And that's because we haven't, we probably haven't finished all of our application code. Let's go take a look. It's still alone. Oh, what's that? So this is open, set gate open. It's actually actively weird that it worked on the client and not on the server. Uh, let me run that again one more time and take a look. So we walk in. Uh, it's in standalone. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. It's in standalone still. Oh, it's in standalone. They're in their own world. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> this was I was trying to say. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so let's go for a listen server. Okay. There you go. Okay, cool. Our thing lights up on both the server and client. But it, it's still not great because if um, if it loses relevancy and then comes back, it's going to be in the wrong state. So let me let's go and finish off the code. We just got our sort of test setup going. So um, we have our change function. We have an animation that can play. Uh, what we need to do now is go up here, and the way I do it is just on construction. Or sorry, not construction. Ooh, definitely not construction. On begin play, I'll call the open change function and uh, basically at this point tell it to, yes, actually skip the animation. And this has a side effect, which is that um, our, our change function might get called more often than it should. Because what will happen is if, if that actor pops into existence and it's in a particular state, um, the on rep function will call will get called while the actor is still like in its um, begin play initialization stuff, and so because begin play gets called anyways after the fact, uh, what I like to do is something like this: um, is initial rep, and then basically say um, if it has has actor begun play. Basically, if you if you haven't begun play, hold on, has begun. There you go. That's the one we want to call. So basically, if the actor hasn't begun play and you're in this, you are like 99% sure to be like in the initial replication stage of data when this thing just spawned into the world, right? And this will and basically what you do is you would say, well, if this is the initial replication, uh, just bail. We don't need to do. And, ooh, sorry, I put this in the wrong function. This uh, kind of only ever has meaning inside of a rep function, right? So you, you would do basically something like this and say, OK, if this is the initial replication, uh, just don't bother calling the change function because we know that after that is complete, after the, the actor becomes relevant, we're going to call on change opened to be true anyways, right? And this will cover both your um, your replication case and also your uh, join in progress case. In fact, I, I probably could have shown you the join in progress first, so you'd see what problem we're fixing. Let me let me just try to do that. So one one trick, if you ever want to test join in progress, um, right now we have two clients connected to each other. In in Unreal, uh, four point basically in any of the Unreal four versions, you can go and type open. 127.0.0.1 and connect. So far in Unreal 5, I found that not to be true. Um, it just basically sort of doesn't do anything. What's actually happening under the hood is that it's looking for a host to connect to. So whatever this is hosting on, it's probably not um, 127.0.0.1. So what you can do instead to get around that is open up a third person map, um, which is just the name of the map we're in right now. Go a question mark, listen. And I'm sorry if that's very small for people on stream, but now, uh, doo -doo -doo. hold on, we don't need this trigger volume anymore. I will pull this fellow out. Okay, cool. So this is my host. He's standing over here. 
And at this point, if I were to like, ooh, we, okay. If I were to do this, I would pop back in and voila, I'm in the game world again. So that would be like a join in progress case, right? So if, for instance, I were to comment out this code that we just did, so let's comment out this and let's comment out uh, the begin play on open change bit. Take a look at what happens. Probably what we should expect to have happen is that the um, person will come into game, but then end up playing the animation. So you'll see that thing go from like red to red to blue or something like that. Let's uh, let's see. Sorry, let me retrigger that. The the volume is set to only change color when someone leaves. So okay, this is now lit. Let's rejoin. Then probably yeah, you saw the animation there for a second. I can't see me pointing at my screen. I'll do it again. But if you watch the cube, you're going to see it's going to start red and then go to go to green. So not this is not a big deal if um, it's just like something really small. But like if you're if you have like particles that play, if there's like a sound that plays when you know our gate opens or things like that, when someone joins into the game, they're just going to hear all those like thunks and explosions or whatever else, depending on whatever. The state of the thing you're trying to model is so that's like the fix basically is to mainly it's to basically do this up here with on open change true and then to sort of keep the on replicate from getting called down here just so you don't end up sending too many mixed signals because like um at least with like making actors like this it's it can be important that the events that you create for like artists or or your designers or whoever else is like filling in the blueprint back end don't get called more than once or more than when they should so even though um let me show you if i just run this version which is setting the gate to open and then calling it on begin play i drop uh, a couple prints down here it will say be uh, opened. And then down here, it'll be closed. Okay, cool. Um, now I think when we run the game, we should start seeing, okay, cool. So they, they both connected. And if you look at the top left, it just said closed, closed, right? And so um, as I walk in there, you can sort of see that, yes, it opened on both the server and the client, closed on both the server and client. Great. So let me recreate our earlier test and the, where the server is basically standing in the open zone. And I'll jump back and I will, oh, ah, sorry, I have to do this again. Um, open third person map, question mark, listen to get a server up so he can be in an open state. And now this guy will, will connect to the game. So we'll go open 127001. And so if you look at the messages, you'll actually see a couple open messages there on the client when you probably don't, you only want one. Like what's, what's happening is it's coming through here and it's basically saying, oh, I've replicated, play the animation, right? And then immediately after, like pretty much on the same frame, begin play is coming through and saying, oh, actually skip the animation. And if you had like an effect or a sound playing on the very first frame of your animation, which isn't unlikely, um, you would end up still hearing the sound play because it's getting called pretty much when it shouldn't, right? But if we comment this stuff out or put this back in, for instance, and reconnect. Uh, did I actually? Second. OK, so that, that worked. The thing that made me impressed is that Unreal's um, system, like it, I'm doing the, the compile while running, is working really, really well. Like this is kind of stellar for Unreal 5. This is running preview too, but I've never actually had it work this well. Usually it just breaks and you have to, to restart the engine. So 
Y'all are me impressed. That is kind of cool. So yeah, so now we basically only get one client open call, right? And that sort of keeps uh, keeps our effects animations and stuff like that playing when they should. Does all that make sense? Any comments? Any questions? I've been talking a lot. <clears throat> I, I actually have a, a bit of a question, but it, it's been great so far. Like this is great stuff. Um, I'm also very impressed that live coding hasn't broken for you immediately. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, this is this is something I've dealt with and I've worked on and stuff like that. But I think it'd be a good showcase. Is uh, what about if you set the timeline to like five to ten seconds and you had the player join in progress while it was animating. How would yeah, you okay. make those up? That is an yeah. excellent question. Yeah. Okay, so in, in that particular case, what we'd want to do is we'd want to actually serialize basically our, our animation progress. So you would do something like this. You'd basically say, make another replicated variable, call it uh, progress or anim progress. And inside of the, um, when we go to basically do the, the replicated lifetime stuff, rather than saying do rep lifetime, you would do do rep lifetime um, only when you start, which I think is, uh, it used to be like initial only. Hold on, let me see if I can find the syntax for it. Yeah, I think uh, it's mode of conditional. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds right. Condition, right? Yeah. And then, like, one of the parameters is, like, initial. Yeah. Let me see if cond initial only, this guy. Yeah, so that'll be, like, the third property. So you would do, like, a uh, gate. You would have, um, oh, sorry, um, anim progress. And then you would have cond initial only. And so what this what this will basically do is as it changes during runtime, it won't tell the client about its animation progress. Or at least the, the, the replication, the, the stuff we talked about here that kind of like magically detects if a variable has changed and sends it across, it just won't do that. It'll only do that when something spawns, when something becomes relevant. And what that lets you do um, uh, is that you can, when you basically go to start your uh, animation inside your blueprint or hopefully inside code or something like that, um, you could basically take your timeline, timeline components, uh, I think it's, uh, if you go in the variables, section in the components oh, yeah, yeah. Up in there. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Thank you. So you'd basically say to him, you could say, you know, set progress or uh, sets new time, I guess, to basically be the animation progress of the server at the moment that you connected, right? So let's just say that, um, let me give it a compile. So impressed with, with live coding right now. This is the real star of the show. Get animation progress. Or get anim. Uh, what did I call it? That's also probably when I jinx live coding and it just totally breaks. It's entirely my problem, my, or my fault. Um, we have to make this blueprint read uh, only. Actually, we'll make it blueprint read right. Yeah, that's probably right. And so what we will do is when we come in, we will try to basically set the value to be whatever anim progress is. And then as the um, the timeline plays, we'll just set the value of anim progress continuously. And I th think that will do it. So. Can I can I kind of bring in my yeah. uh, my side of when I've done that? So, what I've actually done in the past is uh, is I've mar I've I've done the replicated uh, animation, but as like the time that I get from the game state because it has a um, 
a replicated value between that for the time that the game state's been running. And I've been using that. And then like when I want to sync in, I'll just get oh, the yeah. difference of when it started versus, and if it's playing, if it's playing right now, obviously like a Boolean yeah. flag or something, but like um, I'll check to see the difference of that. And then I'll jump to the time. So that way it's not even having to replicate constantly. It's just when it starts and when it stops and stuff or any extra yeah, times. That's, that's a really good way of doing it. Yeah. So you're you're taking, but you're taking the game time on the um, server, or no? You so you take the difference in in game yeah, time, yeah, from, right? from like, the game state, because that's a yeah. a replicated value that I knew was already replicating in the game state, and it's synced up usually with the client and server. So, oh, in the cool. case of like, I didn't realize that the game the game state yeah. time was replicated like that. That's cool. Yeah, the, it's a uh, get server seconds, I think, or get. Yeah. Do you know that replicates us? Yeah. Pardon. Sorry, I was just going to ask, do you know that that replicates? Before, like, because if someone joins, do you know that that's going to get replicated before the the other parts uh, are going to depend on it? So far, I haven't run into issues where it's gotten in afterwards. It usually all comes in as a bundle, at least from what I've seen, of like all the replicated properties that need to be synced up. And by the time like this happens where it needs to be synced in for like an animation or something, like it's already been aligned up. Yeah. I found that, like, in general, like, you don't notice on the client when things are, like, a little bit out of sync as far as the animation progress goes like this. Um, generally, like, even if it's, even like this, you're not going to be perfectly in sync with the animation. You're going to be off by, like, ping seconds or something like that at, at, at best, right, assuming there aren't other slowdowns. But both these approaches are just kind of, like, doing the best, getting like a reasonably good approximation of like how far in it's gone before that that happens, right? And so in this case, like you would basically when the gate opened, you would basically take this and then store it into a, the, the replicated variable, right? Or when the gate closed, I guess? Uh, yeah, when it, would you when have it two? starts, when it opens, yeah. When the gate opens, uh, I guess, yeah, it would be the case of like probably just knowing which direction I'm going in. And then, yeah, um, yeah, from there, I'm just caching a time on when it starts because it's really only animating. It can really only anim animate with one timeline at the moment. But if it's like yep. two different animations, it's probably a different time that needs to be replicated for that start yeah. as well. This is also like a good example of like there are a lot of different ways to potentially achieve these sorts of things. I haven't actually run this to see if it works. Uh, I can give that a go too. All right, can I just interject here? Yeah, please. Um, you've used the replicated variable on begin play, but would the variable actually have replicated um, when begin play is called? So in the moment that the um, actor becomes relevant to the client or when you when you join, the server for, uh, so this is this is specific to actors that have been spawned into the world dynamically. What I'm about to say, but the um, the the data about that actor is accurate in itself, like it's complete. So you're not getting like some sort of partial values. Um, okay, so it's not I, like I believe it that spawns the actor and then replicates the data. It comes it's Correct. like one bundle. Okay, cool. Yeah, it comes in, in one bundle just before um, begin play is called, actually. So I, I don't, I, thank you very much. I don't know if it's in the same frame or not, but it might be or fairly close. It, it is. There, it's actually yep. in the. I, I've looked at it. It's in the initialization process. So the actor is first receive uh, replicated values, uh, and then it does a. I forget the name of the function, but it literally has like receive them and then update those replicated values. Then continue yep. with the begin play process. Yeah. Probably post initialize something like this. So um, I'm going to see if I can actually test this to work. For that to be true, I'm going to have to put this out to like 10 seconds. Oh, wait, no, wrong one. Push this out here. Let's see if it functions. We've been pretty good so far on actually getting things to work. So, OK, that's going to take 10 seconds to happen. Perfect. Let's. Um, Let's get our server going. So open third person map. Question mark, listen. Uh, and then let's go grab our client. 
and connect them. So, oh, right. I guess it's it's already animating. So I'll, I'll give it a second to um, finish animating. Actually, here it's been long enough. Maybe it's been long enough. Let's hope. Are you going to be red? Or are you going to be like, oh, that's too close to tell? Okay, let me do it again. So I'm going to go in here. So it's clearly changing color in the right direction, right? And if it's a bright green, it failed. So yeah, it didn't actually replicate properly there. I could try to debug this, but the general solution is somewhere in this vein. I don't know if you guys are interested in seeing that. I believe this audience would be, yes. Uh, pardon me? I believe that this crowd would be interested in seeing that, whether you're interested in doing that live on camera is another I mean, question. This is how it goes sometimes. Things just don't work properly. I... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me go take a look. So what's a proper setup to make to only update the door animation? um on the client that triggered it so like if you don't want it to replicate across the network you yeah. would uh yeah so you'd probably just not bother replicating the the variable at all like you would just you do almost everything that we did right now um but you just wouldn't make this replicated right and then whether the door is open or not is just up to the client to decide and that would be so so with some caveats like you wouldn't at that point make this function uh, authority only. And then like whatever your trigger volume, for instance, is um, certainly wouldn't want these authority checks. In this case, I'm trying to be like very specific about, uh, you know, only the server is doing this clearly. So it's, it's, it's working and replicated across the network. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Cool. And regarding like how much of the networking work was done in C++ versus blueprints or how to decide what should be implemented in blueprints, that is always a tough one. I So you kind of have seen my style a bit and how I chose to sort of make my interface here. I like to just expose what the artists or technical artists or designers need to make something work. And then I do ideally do as much else as I can under the hood. Because like something like this isn't, I'm going to zoom out a bit so we can sort of see it all, isn't like a lot of code, right? It's, it's a bit tiny. I apologize for that. But like it's just a few functions and like a couple calls to a particular thing. But if I tried to implement that in Blueprints, it would be like a nest of wires, right? But, you know, I often come up against little problems where like there are things you can only really do in blueprints. Like, let me actually give you a, a neat example. Um, let's say in this particular case, this was like an object that was placed in the world, right? And I want to control whether the gate is open or not. So uh, let's go take a look at our cube and let's go and actually expose the open thing. Um, to, sorry, edit instance only. So what should in theory happen is that when I place the gate, I should have a flag for whether or not this thing is, uh, is open. So this is more like a general question about how I'll, I'll lay out my blueprints to decide what goes in blueprints or not. Um, if I take a look at this class again, see if live coding is, is going to cooperate. Uh, oh, actually, sorry. It's the details panel here I would look at. Yeah, cool. Wow, that's amazing. OK, what what I would want is something where, like, when I click this, I would see this thing change from its open state to its not open state. And I would like to do that in C++. I don't know a way how. Because, like, usually, this is how it would usually go. You would have um, a construction script. That would execute and then based off the state of the door um like set it one way or another right and there's no equivalent as far as i'm aware uh function that i can that can call that does that in c plus plus right there's a like um 
I think it's like user construction script in here. Let me see if I can find it. Let's say I can't find it in code, but let me let me show you, I, I guess, what I would have to do. I'd have to probably do something like this to make it work. Uh, I'd have to make like my change function blueprint callable, which I don't want to do because that's like a very like internal function heavy type of thing, right? Oh, and I would probably have to have, actually, yeah, that, that might actually do it. Or like alternatively, I would make these two events um, blueprint callable and also expose like whether the door is open or not, which is like probably a thing I would want to expose anyway, like is like a bool is door open. Seems like a pretty solid function to have, right? Like there's there's no reason not to have something like that. Like so. And so what what ends up what would happen here is if we called our change function here and told it to skip animations. Um, I believe the whoops, come on back. Uh, if I toggle this, now you're going to see it change dynamically, right? Because what's happening is the change function gets called, and the change function is just going to like assert the state of our uh, of our logic here, right? So if the gate were open, it'll call on gate open. It'll tell it to skip. Uh, the the call stack is going to come into here, and it's going to say, "Oh, I'm open, and I should skip." And so it'll just do whatever the the end result is for this nicely, neatly reversible animation. You know what I mean, right? And so I I do something like this begrudgingly because I would prefer to do this in C++. And if I can show you, actually, if my visual or if, um, writer wants to cooperate with the search, yeah, okay, cool. There's a user construction script here. Uh, let's see if we can find out where it's called. Uh, as a heads up, your micro the audio is starting to get kind of robotic. -y. Okay. Thanks. I think um, maybe Unreal is thinking really hard in the background, or actually. I'm just looking at my uh, my task manager rider is um, desperately trying to index Unreal Engine for me. Uh, hopefully, I can convince it to chill. Let me just try shutting down the editor to get a little bit more memory back because this part doesn't actually need it. I'd like to go to the implementation of this function, please. Oh, sorry, the place where this function is called. Maybe I can guess. Construction scripts? Yeah, it's called on, on construction. Uh, on construction? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'll do a search on construction. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe a little before that. It's more. On construction. I'm spelling that correctly, right? Yeah, probably not this. Maybe this one actually post. Uh, sorry, I have a vague memory of where this is in code. So there is a function called execute construction, which Perhaps is inside it. It, uh, it runs a function called process user construction script. Um, this is looking correct. Yes. OK, yeah, exactly this one. Yeah, so process user construction script, I think here calls the user construction script. Yeah, and this is the one that runs here. And so. What we would kind of need is like um, a function here. Uh, yeah, let me modify it. Sorry. 
like something that's like native user construction script or something like that that I could then overload because at the moment there's no like there's no place here so I I feel like it would be like a worthy pull request to kind of get that exposed just so that we don't have to expose like internal functions in C++ to to blueprints um but I don't know what do you guys think of the the on construction method that someone mentioned just now is actually virtual. Uh, sorry, virtual. So it's overridable. Oh. Uh, but the conditions and the order that it gets called in is slightly different. Yes. I think I remember at one point trying to deal with that, and then ending up being unhappy with the way the the order was called. But I could just be mistaken. I I certainly don't know any everything. <laughs> so yeah. Maybe that one would actually do. Thank you, guys. Ah, sorry. Unfortunately, with my IntelliSense not, or uh, whatever, source control not working, it's a bit difficult to navigate. But yeah, that's that's sort of like the general gist of when I'll decide to like put something in code or put something um, out into uh, a blueprint. I just try to do as much as possible in code and then just leave the blueprints to like do the stuff that drives effects or just the stuff that's like easy and, and light to write. And for sure, like I, I've I've never tried to do heavy network code in, in blueprints. Um sometimes you just do because you know there's been somebody who's built the system in blueprints and you go and you try to fix it up. But generally when it gets complicated, I'll like I'll make like a C plus plus class for it, and that makes life easier. That makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. We've crushed a lot of stuff today. That was that was nice. Um, do you guys have any other questions? Anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So something we haven't mentioned today, but uh, I would be like really happy if I could ask about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's about roles and stuff. Um, so like generally, oh, yeah. um, uh, sorry, just one second. No worries. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so like, the, my question was like generally like we have this like role authority um and like they say it's the author like if you if you're like role authority then you're running yeah. on the server side of that of, of an actor yes. so like it, it's it's not always true right like it could be like you're the role authority but you're running client correct well yeah so there's a there's a um, there's a special kind of role called autonomous proxy which might be what you're thinking of in fact, actually, maybe I can if I can run the game. I can breakpoint and show you the various states. But like this this kind of pattern that we've talked about, where we're just having like somebody be on the server and replicating out their state, works most cases. But if you ever get to a situation where like you're controlling a player character or you need immediate response to what you're doing, uh, it doesn't cut it from an endpoint standpoint. Like if you imagine trying to move forward and then waiting ping seconds for that message to go to the server and then come back before moving you forward, it immediately feels sluggish and awful. And under those circumstances, there's um, Unreal has this term that, I, frankly, I, gets used even outside of Unreal um, called autonomous proxy, which is, is like a simulated proxy, but there is shared authority between one of the clients and the, um, and the server. And what generally happens is that, like, for instance, let's imagine that we're going to use this diagram here. Let's say in this case, there's a pawn, um, and this is like pawn A, right? And this guy is the, the player controlled character or something like that. The server is considered still to be authority on pawn A, right? This is like kind of authority in that. For everybody else, this guy gets treated like a simulated proxy in that he is he may go irrelevant. Um, when it moves, his position is probably serialized through um, through like the replicated like a like a vector or something like that. 
that positions him in the world. Um, and then they just sort of like lerp and like blend his position around. But for the remote client, when he says, I move forward for an autonomous proxy, he will like literally move his character forward and tell the and not wait for the server to uh, tell him that back that you that they've moved forward. And under this circumstance, the server is still the authority over this particular thing, but um, he just kind of has like special special circumstances, right? And if if for instance he goes into a location or moves really far away, like further than the server thinks he should be able to move, um, the server will will basically correct that action and say, no, 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 you are actually supposed to be here, right? So even in cases where like you're you're sharing authority, I guess with a with a local client, the server is still like the authority on this particular system. Right. Yes. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like um, the, the thing, like how I think exactly like this thing, like how you think about player controllers. So yeah, you're like the autonomous proxy, but autonomous proxy is the like role of the client itself and role authority is the role like when you're the server side of that player controller, right? The, um, yeah, there's, so there's, there's two variables. There'll be like for a given pawn, there'll be a variable called, um, role and another variable called remote yeah, role. remote role yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Right. and so yeah, exactly right. whenever your role is authority on something i unless you're doing some crazy peer-to-peer -peer setup which i i haven't really done and i don't know if unreal does very well um basically you are the server right but you might be in a situation where it says the remote role is role authority but then the role is like simulated proxy, or autonomous proxy. And if you're breakpointed at a state like that, you've breakpointed onto a client. That's one way you can tell that you're on a client. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. I, <clears throat> like if a client spawns an actor, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the way it should oh, yeah. be, but it's like, if a client like spawns an actor, so that actor is a role authority. Okay. So, um, I'm not sure what the state of the variable would be, but if the client spawns an actor, that actor will only exist on the client and won't actually be anywhere else. And it's a good question. I don't know what the what the networking state for that is exactly, but it kind of at that point won't matter because it won't be in any other space. And there's probably going to be like some configuration of the variables that um, makes that the case. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. Cool. Um, any other questions? Um, hey, can you talk a little bit more about uh, client RPC and also NetMuchCast? Yeah, so, um, OK. Uh, why they're not good? Uh, why you should Oh, yeah, right. Um, yeah, I, I glossed over that. Just avoidable. OK, yes, avoid if possible. So we just looked at. Um, a case with like join in progress, where like maybe by default the gate is closed, and then the server goes in and he's opened the gate, so the the thing is is green. Um, and then imagine if at if if we were broadcasting the state of the open via something like this client net multicast stuff. Um, if you weren't connected at the time that that message goes out, you just never get that message, right? So whenever like somebody joins in progress partway through, they would never have gotten the message that the thing opened, and then the thing would just look close to them, even though they've connected. So the join in progress case would be broken. And so there are like tons of issues kind of in that vein, where you basically get no permanence um, on this sort of this sort of thing. And it's and it's sort of tricky because it's never obvious, right? Like when you're just like booting and testing your game, you don't know that this is broken until like way down the line when you're actually like doing a lot of live tests and things like that. And you're like, oh, what's going on? Oh, I need to account for this. And then you end up, if you if you carry on using these functions, you end up writing like tons of like spaghetti code, trying to arrange things such that you remember that this is like this and, and this is like that and all those sorts of things. I have... Um, shipped games without ever using this functionality. Uh, you can usually find a way to do what you're doing here 
using um, net serialize or, uh, or replication. Um, there are exceptions. Like, I mean, so I've also shipped games where they did use this, and they've been often so fraught with bugs that the solution has often been to just not to stop using it <laughs> and to just do it the other way, which is kind of funny. Um, I can okay, I, I can think of maybe one valid use case for this, but even that one still has an asterisk. And that would be like if you were trying to do chat or something like that, such that you don't really want to serialize loads and loads of string data and send it across the network because that could basically take a bit of a footprint. Fair, totally. And so whenever someone types in a chat message, you would like net multiclass or client multicast it to everybody. Um, and then it would pop into their chat log, and that would be it. And if somebody joined later, then you know they would just not not see any chat history because there just wouldn't be chat history. You know what I mean? The, and then you could basically yeah. like start from there, and then maybe mutate it and change it and do do more stuff with it. But in order to like guarantee that everyone got chat messages, for instance, you'd have to make this thing reliable, right? And as soon as you make it reliable you're going to end up paying a really high cost of like the engine potentially a, a relatively high cost of the engine basically needing to like talk back and forth and make sure that the message was received and if you don't put like a throttle on how often users can send their messages or send chat messages like that you can actually cause serious network issues and someone could just like spam your server with a billion of these and it'll just like slow the entire game down to a crawl and crash it maybe or something like that so there's so much pain in this direction if you go in here carelessly that my general advice is to just do it another way. It, this should this should always be like one of those things, in my opinion, that you can use if you need to. It's nice to know it exists, right? But otherwise, like you know, ne touche pas, don't 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 don't. Yeah, it'll it'll it might save you effort. But I mean, there's probably an edge case for everything, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, today I was trying to implement a in-progress function uh, functionality, but I was using a client RPC, yep. so I was and getting you know, the same problem. Your explanation. It is totally normal to do that as like your first instinct. In fact, like the engine kind of like features this front and center, and it's nice that it has the functionality. But like generally speaking, this is the way to go while being mindful of uh, the limitations it kind of has, both with regards to like serializing large blocks of data and um, trying to deal with like order and things like that between variables, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I can uh, like talk, also, mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, there's also a macro um, in new function called reliable and unreliable. Uh, do you know? Yeah, that's right. In fact, I think you have to specify it now. So whenever you specify your your um, RPC. your remote procedure calls, you actually have to say, are they going to be reliable or unreliable? And your instinct should always be, I want things to be unreliable because that's the the cheap way of doing it. But occasionally, if you do have to make if you do have to make something reliable, it's not the end of the world. I mean, it, plenty of games have to. You know, it's just convenient to do this. The the trick is to, um, pardon my circles, I suck at circles, to make sure you, you rate limit how often it can be called one way or the other. Like if it's, if it's user input, just try to make sure they're not calling it like more than once a second or more than once every, you know, X, you know, relatively short period of time. And then your reliable stuff is probably not going to cause an issue. But the way that it gets out of hand is like potentially like you there's like tons of actors and things going on in the game and if something is just sending unreliable uh, reliable messages every frame nonstop you're going to create like this huge backlog queue and burden on the server of trying to do to to handle that and that's when things can go a little off the rails with usage of reliable so it's more of like a be aware that this is expensive right but you know don't let it stop you from using it it's the, the times where I've seen this go poorly have been when people don't realize it's expensive and end up calling it in places that um, are actually getting called really, really frequently, right? I actually, I actually have a story from that. Yeah, please. You want to hear it? Um, so this was 
luckily it was during our initialization process so like it wasn't too heavy for everyone but it was the thing of we had uh, about eight clients connecting to a game um and you know when you uh, during this initialization process, they had to send a reliable message to the server um, on begin play, and this or not on begin play, but while this initialization process was running. And the way we did it was in an on rep. Now the issue was the on rep would also fire for uh, non autonomous proxies of the of the players. So you had eight people having this process where they're sending it to the server times how, how many other versions of them from the autonomous proxy or simulate proxy. So it's trying to send those. And we would have like huge chunks of network bandwidth coming from that just because we weren't only requiring only the players pawn to yeah. send this. So that's something to also yeah. look out for. It's crazy how quickly like things can multiply out when you have like lots of things running around. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Cool. So this talk has been going for uh, an hour and a half. It's pretty good. Oh, no worries. No worries. Um, so oh, like I have a yeah. like, small question. Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, so, Scott. We can't hear you. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So Nisrealize um, is a is a bit is a less expensive than reliable RPC. Um, yes, yes, because it is. Uh, basically, it won't guarantee that you receive everything, but it'll try to guarantee you receive the latest. And on top of that, it has like a lot of optimizations under the hood about how it sends the data. So it will um, it'll do a few things. Like it'll have priority. So like the various actors in your game can all have varying priorities. And when your game's bandwidth is limited, it'll like spread out the usage and replication of, of basically replicated actors um, according to how important they are, right? So you can have like, you know, your, your, your autonomous, like people near the player, you know, at higher priority probably um, like maybe like cutscenes and things like that that just are happening right now and are really important and not quite as important as that door like 10 meters away or, or like a mile away or whatever else. So it'll it'll balance, load balance, and Unreal actually does this really, really well. Like it'll both balance like the amount um, across priority, but also just it can do a lot of clever things while it's streaming the data from a server to a client to like only stream like the difference and a, a whole bunch of optimizations that go like that. So this is definitely faster. I don't, I wouldn't want to speak with authority about exactly what it does because I haven't really dug into all of that code. I just vaguely looked at it, was was impressed, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So generally, like um, reliable RPCs don't do that. Like all these smart stuff. Yeah, like a reliable yeah. RPC will do exactly what it says. It has no idea about your context. So it'll say, oh, you want to send this message? I will send this message. And then it'll do something like, hi, server, I'm sending you a message. Here you go. And then it'll wait for the server to say, hey, yes, I received your message. Thank you. And if it doesn't receive that, it'll send it again, right? And it might, like, cause it to time out or things like that. And, like, it doesn't really understand a failure condition. I actually don't know what would happen if the server just never acknowledged the receipt of a reliable RPC or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas with with the replicated stuff, um, if it doesn't work, it'll work eventually. Like the, the, the engine is going to at some point end up synchronizing you to the latest value. So the worst thing that'll happen is that you'll miss something, but you'll end up writing your code such that you're accounting for potentially missing something. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, no, no. And I, I feel like I should almost go over like one particular pattern with um with net serialized or with, with replicated variables. If you if it's really important to catch the edge from like one to two, right? 
Let me let me quickly describe this one. So this is um, often how I'd like create weapons or things like that inside like a first person shooter. It's if this is like the number of times the um, the thing is fired and you want to know like or maybe an example would be like whether or not you're holding the trigger on a gun, right? So if you if you did this as like a bool, right? You might say, okay, this is my. Oops, let me get up a color. I will jump to it. Okay, so let's imagine this is a bool um, that is like whether the trigger is held down or not. And so I'm going to show you the broken version first, right? If on the server you were to basically say, okay, hey, I'm holding the trigger, and then oh, hey, I release the trigger, and then on the client. Um, you you happen to miss this particular frame, you just never end up knowing that the trigger was was pulled, and that might you might have needed to play an effect. You might have needed to know that something has changed, right? And sure. so the the trick is you basically make a struct, and you basically say, okay, this is uh, an integer with a number of activations. And this is another integer with an amount of deactivations. And you replicate the struct. You'll have like some, some things for, for interpreting it. But if you imagine that um, I'm going to draw it like this, such that they're like next to each other, because they're both variables in the struct. So this is my, my activations. This is my deactivations. Oops, let me make that a box. OK, cool. When you pull the trigger, you would then go and actually, I'm going to pick another color. Suck. We OK, cool. So let's say at the beginning, nothing has changed, right? And on, on the client, you're also at 0, 0, right? Um, you could say, OK, hey, I pulled the trigger. That's a 1, 0 state, right? And so over here, the client, and then let's say you release the trigger. Then what you do is you just increment increment the deactivation state over here, and you never like decrement, right? And then if you pull the trigger again and you uh, deactivate even in the same frame, that's that's okay too. And then on the client, what you can do is you can now interpret this data such that you always know whether an activation happened or not. Like for instance, if you happen to get this particular packet, you're going to end up with a one zero, right? And that's going to mean that um, the trigger is currently pulled, but it has not been released, right? So you can play a machine gun sound or something like that, right? If it's just like, duh, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, if you happen to get this signal, right? Even if you came from zero, zero, oh, sorry, that's the wrong number, right? You would know that, oh, hey, I came from zero, zero, and I'm now currently one, one. That means uh, the trigger was pulled and released. So play a muzzle flash, even if it's a bit late. Right? Just go bang. Right? And then similarly, you can take, like, as far as it matters, right? Like, if the only information you ended up getting from this entire sequence is that you're now at 2 2, you'll at least know potentially that you've had a couple gunshots fire, for instance. So these are like little tricks you can use to sort of interpret the data and get around, like, the, the fact that if, if these two were like separate variables in in u properties inside of the um inside of the actor class then you just you wouldn't know that right yeah like you you would get them like um replicated back to you at different frames so yeah yeah exactly the order uh, as far as i understand is not guaranteed right so mm -hmm. how to fire a gun well cool yeah so well, often there's tricks similar to this that you can pull pretty much anywhere down the line um, to sort of like not end up using this sort of system, um, but use like really efficient replication and and get all that stuff figured out. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, like my second question would be a, a bit off topic, but what is mm -hmm. this tool called um, that you like draw stuff and stuff? Like it's really nice tool. Oh, this thing is uh, Leonardo. I really quite like it. It's I think if you search for Leonardo app, it'll come up on Google. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. I um it, just got my it. John 
yeah, go ahead. It, it has an infinite canvas. So if you're making notes, you don't have to worry about running out of room. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, is exactly. <laughs> and, and no text tool. Yeah. So this thing is, it's nice for that. Um, I've actually really enjoyed having a tablet. I've only had one for a few months, but I tend to like, when we were not during COVID, I would draw on whiteboards a lot. And this has kind of let me go back to like drawing on whiteboards and sharing with people. So I, I quite enjoy using this app for this. I, I will second that recommendation. A really good yeah. program for doodling out ideas. Yep. Yep. I have a sort of question. Um, yeah, go ahead. As far as uh, like, uh, I forget kind of the phrasing here, but uh, like uh, if you're having like a projectile, kind of like a moderately slow one, <clears throat> uh, I've heard before that that's something you would well, you would want to be reliable. But if there's like many of them or somewhat many of them, I guess I would want to know what your opinion on that would be. Yeah, so projectiles are tricky. Um, there's, here's what I found in practice, right? If somebody fires a gun, the two things that you're, you're most needing to, to show on the client is an effect when uh, the thing is spawned and an effect when um, it hits the ground. Um, those are like the two most key. You, your point was specifically about slow moving projectiles. And what, what I do is like this bullet or a rocket or whatever it is that's, that's zipping along, um, this is its own actor. I mark it as replicated, right? And I just let it come in whenever it comes in, right? It may, like if you fire the gun, and you view it on the client, you won't see the bullet start like right at its, uh, at the muzzle of the gun, but you have the muzzle flash play there anyway. So it generally doesn't matter. Right. And then this thing can just like pop in whenever the replicated stuff gets in and then goes across. And this in particular, isn't necessarily using anything reliable, um, or, or, or anything in this particular grid. It's just relying on Unreal to basically say, oh, hey, I, I spawned an actor on the server. Um, please make it for all of my clients, right? And though that actor has like a, a like lifetime of like a rather brief window, um, it, Unreal does like a pretty good job of actually making it appear in time. But I bet you if you go look at most games with those kinds of slow moving projectiles, Many of them will just not bother to do anything other than like this bare minimum. If for some reason it's really important to get it right, what you can do is you can um, spawn the projectile on the client as well. And then when the projectile gets spawned via replication, like do, do everything else the way it is, destroy the earlier one, spawn the first one, or cause your first one to like, to lerp in towards the, the the second one, right? And that'll just like I, I would I would take it on a case by case basis because it's one of those things that's really easy to over over solve in the first place. Um, I would do it the simplest way first, and then only afterwards if I'm really observing a problem after I've really nailed like the muzzle flash and explosion, right? And like that, that these two things are happening correctly on clients um, to the point that like in the past, when an explosion happens, I, can literally, I literally make that like a simulated proxy, an explosion actor that I, I want to replicate, play out as explosion and then die on a client, right? Such that I don't rely on the, the projectile to, to do the trick because then you might miss it if it goes really, really fast, right? And the 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 scale of numbers we're talking about in terms of like how quickly Unreal replicates this across is usually good enough in my experience to hide the fact that any of this stuff is is going on, right? It's all smoke and mirrors. Have you uh, have you played with no, have you played with Unreal's prediction key stuff? Or? I read through the uh, article. I saw you link it a little while back, actually, and it was super interesting. I loved it. I was uh, quite impressed with that. I can I can share the link 
That means T. I think prediction key. Uh, hold on, let me. So this thing here. This looks like a regular documentation page. It's something Old Siren found uh, a little while ago. Um, but it has like one of the best descriptions of how multiplayer programming works that I've read. Just it, it's it's describing how a uh, game playability system deals with um, multiplayer stuff. But it's effectively dealing with these problems of like how to simulate an action on a client and then um, wait for the server to acknowledge it and then abort and rewind the application uh, or rewind the effect if it if the server disagreed with whether it should happen or not and things like that right so it's kind of cool for sure yeah um it's probably worth noting on that that's being broken out i think into a new plugin called network prediction i think they've talked about rewriting character movement component so the, there's the, um, and gameplay abilities are both using the same prediction framework. So it's probably coming sometime in the future. The um the guy that was working on that left epic, uh there's no clear Oh did he? Is anybody gonna be working on that? That was Dave Ratty, the guy that has all of the talks on um on gameplay on gameplay abilities. So even if Oh that's um, unfortunate. They don't end up doing it. Like the idea behind this is very simple in terms of like what it is and, and how it works. Uh, it's like just basically a key that you map that's just like formalized such that you don't have to. So you could just like read it and recreate it potentially. Um, although it would be like really nice to actually have it built into the engine so you don't have to. Unreal has been really good about like updating the engine over time and like dealing with a lot of the problems that I used to have to like solve myself, like especially with like characters moving on a client and then and then lerping the position and making sure that it's smooth and 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 error correcting and things like that it it already does like all those things practically for you in a pretty competent way so it seems like they're they're pretty on top of things cool um i think we've covered a ton today uh i'm very happy that this seems to have been helpful for people. Thank you so much for coming to the talk. Yeah, thank you so much for. Thank yeah, you. That was phenomenal. Thank you so much for for giving this amazing talk. I learned so much. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Thanks all.